Hello everyone, welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna show you how to design a flyback transformer that will be compatible with the flyback converter project we showed in an earlier video. Now, if you remember that flyback converter project, you will remember that we had a custom transformer requirement for that particular flyback converter. So I'm gonna show you how to design that transformer, starting with the coil inductances, and then going all the way to core and coil former selection. Let's jump in and get started. So in our previous video, we went over how to design a custom flyback converter and do the PCB layout. But one thing we didn't touch on in that earlier video was how to design a custom flyback transformer. So by the end of this video, you're gonna see how to design a custom flyback transformer just like the one that you see here on screen. This flyback transformer is designed using a coil former and a core. These two pieces can be purchased off the shelf from several different vendors. What we're gonna do is use two parts that are recommended by Texas Instruments, available from TDK. You can purchase them off DigiKey or Mauser, and you can assemble your own transformer in-house. What we're gonna do now is calculate the inductance that we need in each coil for our custom flyback transformer, starting with some of the constraints that we have in our converter design. So first, let's take a look at the topology of our design and how it interfaces with this custom transformer. So here we have the UCC28881. Here we have this uh, primary coil on the transformer connected to the drain pin. Here we have our polarity marker. And here we have our secondary coil. And then this basically becomes our ground. Now here on the output side, we also have a diode for rectification. And then here we're going to get our output voltage, again, with respect to this ground on the secondary side. So here when we designed this, we had a V out of 3.3 volts. This diode is a Schottky rectifier diode. It has a forward voltage of 0.5 volts. We have a current limiting function here inside of this driver. So this current limiting function limits the peak pulse current coming into the drain pin to be I peak less than 770 milliamps. Now we don't want to design this transformer in such a way that we determine LP and LS while keeping the peak current on the primary side below 770 milliamps. Now there's also a duty cycle limit on this driver. The duty cycle maximum for this driver is basically 50%. Now it varies a little bit if you look at the data sheet specs, it varies between 45 and 55%, but we wanna keep it below 50%. So for our operating specifications, we're going to design this such that our peak current at our nominal duty cycle is going to be half of this value, or 385 milliamps. And then we're going to set our duty cycle at the target output voltage to be 30%. Now, why did I pick these two values? Well, I could have chosen a higher peak current value, let's say 500 milliamps if I want to, and I could operate this thing at its maximum duty cycle of 50% if I want to. I think it's a good idea to fit this in different ranges, especially the duty cycle. That way, this duty cycle can compensate up or down as needed, depending on what happens with the V in here. So for example, if V in drops a little bit, the duty cycle has some room to adjust in order to restore V out to the target value of 3.3 volts. And vice versa if it goes the other direction. If VN goes up for some reason, there's some room for this duty cycle to drop down and restore this target output voltage to 3.3 volts. So our strategy here is first to determine the turns ratio, then we're going to determine the average current on the output, and then using the average current on the output, we're going to determine the secondary inductance that we need to maintain our operating mode, either continuous or discontinuous mode. Then using that, we can determine the primary inductance. And then from there, we can determine what we need to do in terms of an actual transformer assembly, as far as picking materials, and then determining the number of windings that we need in each coil. So first things first, we can use our target value of D and our input and output voltage to determine what is the turns ratio. So the turns ratio NP over NS has a very simple equation, which is just given by this fraction involving the duty cycle and 
V in divided by what is called the flyback voltage, or V out plus VF. Now for my design, my input voltage is 120 volts AC. Now I do this because of course I'm in the United States, but if you were in Europe, you could of course change this to be 240 volts VAC if you like. Now using 120 volts VAC, using my output voltage of 3.3 volts and my forward diode voltage drop of 0.5 volts and my D value that I've chosen, I get a turns ratio of about 19.1. So with NP over NS being 19.1, we could select turns ratios such as 38 to two, 57 to three, and so on and so forth. Now we would like to choose one of these higher turns ratios like this in order to ensure that we reduce the flux density in each side of this transformer. The reason we wanna do that is so that hopefully we avoid saturation of the core when this thing is operating at full load. Now that we know our turns ratio, NP over NS is equal to 19.1, we can use this and the primary peak to determine the secondary peak and the expected output current at this value for the output voltage and duty cycle. So the secondary peak current is related to the average output by this relationship. And so if you just solve for I out using the secondary peak voltage and the primary peak voltage and the turns ratio and the duty cycle, you will find that I out is equal to 2.57 amps. So this is gonna be the maximum output current that you would expect given these conditions and given the amount of current being pulled into the drain. Now using this value of the output current, we can figure out a critical value for the secondary coil inductance that will ensure we have a clear border between discontinuous operation and continuous operation. So that is given by V out plus VF, and then this is multiplied by one minus D squared, divided by two times the output, and divided by the frequency. So our frequency in this converter, F, is 62 kilohertz. Now, if we just plug in all of our values for uh, these different quantities that we see in this fraction, what we're gonna get is a critical value for LS of three microhenries. Now, this is not the value that the secondary coil has to have. It is just the critical value of the coil's inductance above which we would have continuous mode operation and below which we would have discontinuous mode operation. So that's another thing about flyback converters is you can operate them in either mode and both modes have their advantages. In my example, what I'm gonna do is operate it in discontinuous mode just because, hey, I feel like doing that today. One thing I can do is choose a secondary coil inductance that's a little bit below this and that will ensure that this system is always operating in the discontinuous mode, unless our duty cycle changes too much in order to compensate for large changes in the input voltage. So now, using our secondary inductance and our turns ratio, we can figure out the primary inductance. With this turns ratio, I know that the primary inductance is going to be given by this turns ratio squared, multiplied by the secondary inductance. So if I pick, for example, a secondary inductance of 2.25 microhenries, I just multiply that by this squared and I get LP is equal to 820 microhenries. Why did I pick these numbers? Well, as we'll see when we start looking at core and coil former materials, these numbers are going to be achievable with commercially available cores using some of the turns ratio examples that I showed earlier. And in particular, what we're gonna end up choosing is 57 to three for our turns ratio. So once we start looking at core and coil former examples, we'll see why we need this number for the primary turns and secondary turns. It's because we will be able to hit these inductances in a reasonably small package. So let's take a look at some commercial core and coil formers and then we'll see how we get to these values using these numbers of turns. So on screen, I've pulled up the data sheet for the coil former that we want to use for this transformer. Here we have a core that matches the coil former, and then here if I just scroll down a little bit further, you can see a mechanical drawing for the coil former. So this is the coil former that I used in the custom flyback converter design project in an earlier video. 
what we want to do is use this core to design our transformer to have the inductance values that we calculated on the board. Now, just looking through here, you'll see that there are several options for different core materials that have this shape and that will work with our coil former. Now, here we have gapped and ungapped core materials. So the gapped material will have just a little bit of a gap right here at the edge of this E shape in the middle of the coil. That will then modify the inductance value just a little bit. And then you can see here that we have a bunch of part numbers here in these right hand columns. Now, in order to determine the number of turns that you need in each coil, you need to use this AL value. Now, what is this AL value? Well, if you scroll down here to the bottom of this data sheet, what TDK has done is they have created a little glossary inside of this data sheet. And you can see right here, I have the A value pulled up. This is called the inductance factor. So the inductance factor is just equal to an inductance per number of turns squared. Basically, if you just take one of these inductance factor values, multiply it by the number of turns in the coil squared, you will then get the inductance of that coil. So essentially using this 250 nanohenry per turn squared value, what we can do is then take that, multiply it by 57 by 57, and you see that we get 812.25 microhenries. That is very close to the 820 microhenry value that I calculated on the board. Now, this should illustrate why I wanted to go with the 57 to three turns ratio. I was able to get a inductance value that's very close to the calculated value using one of these core materials. So you can see I already did a little bit of homework here to get to this point. How many turns can we fit inside of this coil former? That's a really important point because obviously if you just look at this mechanical drawing, you only have about 13.2 millimeters to fill up in this coil former with wire in order to get your required number of turns. The thickness of the wire that you can use depends on the amount of current it needs to carry. And so of course, if you're carrying higher current, you need thicker gauge wire, and that is going to limit the number of turns that you can use to form your coil. So we can fit a 57 to three turns ratio in this region, but what we're gonna have to do is on the primary coil, we would need to double wrap that coil. So we would have one layer with 29 turns and then another layer with 28 turns wrapped on top of itself on this primary side. And then the secondary side can have three turns. So that's going to allow us to fit all of those turns onto this coil former. That will then allow us to keep this coil former at a reasonable size. Now, if you were carrying more current, what would you have to do? Well, at some point you might have to use larger wire gauge and that might require you to use a physically larger coil former. So that physically larger coil former will then of course allow you to fit all of those turns into this region on the coil former and ensure that you can still hit your inductance targets. So make sure that you always compare this available space with the amount of space you expect to take up with wire gauge. That's going to allow you to then use this reasonably sized core and coil former and that will make sure you don't take up too much space on the board. So now that we've figured out all of this stuff and we've selected a core and coil former and we've selected some wiring that we're gonna need, we can send all of this off to a transformer assembler or you can purchase all the parts and assemble it yourself. So what we're gonna do is get this flyback converter manufactured. I'm gonna put this custom transformer on it and then we'll test it out in another video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. You'll be able to keep up with that update once it comes out. Make sure to leave your comments and questions in the comment section. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.